After 1850, tensions over slavery were at an all-time high. Opposition to slavery intensified when President Franklin Pierce declared his support for strict fugitive slave laws. Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel Uncle Tom's Cabin stirred up disgust for slavery by exposing its cruelty, and westward expansion reignited the debate over slavery in the new western territories. In 1854, Senator Stephen A. Douglas introduced a bill that would create the Kansas and Nebraska territories. The nation was growing rapidly, and the new territories would help expand the country westward. The Kansas and Nebraska territories would be created from the remaining land from the Louisiana Purchase, north of the 3630 Missouri Compromise Line. This meant that both territories were supposed to be free territories due to their location north of the 3630 line. To avoid angering Southerners, Douglas proposed abolishing the Missouri Compromise and allowing popular sovereignty in Kansas and Nebraska, which meant the people would vote on slavery themselves. After intense scrutiny and division in Congress, the Kansas-Nebraska Act became law in 1854. Northerners felt betrayed by the passage of the Kansas-Nebraska Act because it abandoned the agreement made through the Missouri Compromise 34 years earlier. Voters in the new territories could vote to allow slavery in land that had long prohibited slavery and ought to be free. Consequently, many Northerners gave up on ever compromising with the slave South again. In addition, the Democratic Party became divided over slavery and tore itself apart over the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Southern Democrats solidly supported the act, while Northern Democrats mostly opposed it. Feeling betrayed, some Northern Democrats left the party and joined with the former members of the Free Soil and Whig parties to form the new Republican Party. The Republican Party became the predominant anti-slavery party and called for the prohibition of slavery in all new territories. Even the presidential election of 1856 was divided along sectional lines. Democrat James Buchanan, who supported popular sovereignty, won the presidency by winning all of the southern states and most of the border states. Republican John C. Fremont, who supported the prohibition of slavery in new territories, did not receive a single electoral vote in the South. The new Republican Party won a majority in the House of Representatives, despite winning no seats in the South. This showed a deep sectional divide among the electorate and demonstrates that slavery was the most important issue in the election. In 1855, Kansas held elections to elect a territorial government in accordance with the Kansas-Nebraska Act. After over 6,000 votes were cast, a pro-slave legislature was elected to govern Kansas. The anti-slavery citizens of Kansas refused to accept the results of the election because of evidence of massive election fraud. Only 1,500 voters lived in Kansas, yet over 6,000 ballots were cast in the election. Thousands of slavery supporters had crossed over the border from Missouri in armed posses in order to illegally vote in the election. These border ruffians helped to turn the election in favor of pro-slave forces in Kansas. Anti-slavery advocates armed themselves for protection, held their own elections, and adopted a constitution that banned slavery. By 1856, there were two rival governments in the Kansas Territory, one that supported slavery in Kansas and the other that prohibited it. Tensions over slavery in the Kansas Territory finally led to bloodshed in a period that is known as Bleeding Kansas. In 1856, a force of 800 slavery supporters attacked the anti-slavery capital of Lawrence, Kansas. They destroyed the town, attacked innocent people, and burned the governor's home. Hearing of the attack, religious fanatic and fervent abolitionist John Brown rallied a force to retaliate and avenge the Lawrence Raid. Brown's raid along the Potawatomi Creek killed five slavery supporters. As armed posses roamed the territory, Violence and murder continued, and Kansas was in the midst of a civil war over the issue of slavery. Eventually, after nearly a year of bloodshed, the Kansas governor called in 1,300 federal troops and restored order in the territory. The violence over slavery even reached the United States Senate. In 1856, Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner gave a speech on the floor of the Senate that criticized pro-slavery forces in Kansas and attacked some Southern Senators who supported their tactics. Days later, Representative Preston Brooks of South Carolina stormed into the Senate chamber and beat Sumner with his cane. Sumner suffered head injuries so severe that he didn't return to the Senate for several years. In 1857, the Supreme Court stepped into the slavery debate in America and shocked the nation with its landmark Dred Scott decision. 
Dred Scott was a slave who had been taken to live with his master in the free state of Illinois before returning to the slave state of Missouri. When his master died in 1846, Scott sued for his freedom, claiming that he had been emancipated when he was taken as a slave to Illinois, a state where slavery was banned. After 11 years in the courts, Scott's case reached the Supreme Court, where Chief Justice Roger Taney authorized the court's decision. The Supreme Court ruled that Scott was a slave, and as a slave, he was not a citizen, but he was actually property. As property, Scott had no right as a citizen to sue in the courts. In addition, the court ruled that because slaves are property, the right to own slaves is protected by the Fifth Amendment, and no state government nor Congress could constitutionally ban citizens from owning them. Effectively, the Supreme Court had ruled that slavery was protected in the Constitution and that nothing could legally prevent the spread of slavery. In 1858, the argument over slavery was personified through a series of debates between Senator Stephen A. Douglas and a little-known lawyer named Abraham Lincoln. Douglas, known as the Little Giant due to his short stature and powerful influence, argued in support of popular sovereignty in the new Western territories. Douglas defended the stance that the nation could endure as half slave and half free and satisfy the people of each state by letting citizens vote over slavery in their states. Lincoln was the tall, intelligent, but soft-spoken challenger to Douglas's Senate seat in Illinois, and he argued in support of settling the legality of slavery across the nation once and for all. Lincoln defended the stance that slavery would have to be definitively declared either legal or illegal, or it would tear the Union apart. As a Republican, Lincoln personally opposed slavery in the new Western territories. The Lincoln-Douglas debates drew thousands of spectators, stirred civil discussion about slavery in America, and made Lincoln a rising political star. In 1859, John Brown, the religious fanatic and abolitionist who had led a raid that killed five slavery supporters in Kansas, planned to escalate the fight against slavery to a new level. Funded by a radicalized abolition group, Brown led 18 men, including his own sons, in an armed attack on a federal weapons arsenal in Harpers Ferry, Virginia. Brown planned on seizing the weapons stored there and arming local slaves, hoping to incite an armed rebellion against local slave owners. Tipped off to the attack, federal troops shot and killed members of Brown's posse, including his sons, and arrested Brown. Brown was tried in the state of Virginia, convicted of treason and murder, and executed by hanging. Brown's execution sharply divided the country and became a flashpoint. Some Northerners declared Brown a martyr and a hero. Southerners celebrated his execution like a holiday and speculated that Brown's raid was evidence of the North's intentions to bring an end to slavery in America by force and bloodshed. The difference between North and South had come to a head. The South was beginning to feel that they were a separate nation from the North. The divides between the two regions were moving towards disrepair. 